Everybody and welcome to the sixth part of the um, MHNR conference. I can't believe we're on six already. So we're going to see at the end of this week, we've got a two-parter tonight, all about advancing practice. We've got a fantastic panel. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. First, shout out to Vanessa, who's watching and doing social media tonight. So um, do keep your eye out. And if you want to join in, you can follow us on the hashtag on Twitter. That's MHNR2020. And we'd love to hear your questions. Um, actually, your participation is really what's been making this conference so enjoyable. And, and so much fun. So thank you very much for that. If you're watching on Facebook, we want to comment on Facebook Live, uh, just follow the Unite Mental Health Nurses Association stream. And again, you can um, hashtag us, it's all good. So uh, no further ado, obviously I'm Nikki, and I will introduce you to our panel and hand over to the fantastic Mick. So first of all, Jay, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and introduce yourself, please? Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Jay McEwen. I'm, um, work in a kind of in a clinical academic role so I work two days a week within Sheffield Health and Social Care Trust and at the moment I'm part of I've got a research lead role as part of this 70 at 70 program that Carrie-Anne and I want to talk about and then I also work at the University of Sheffield in the Division of Nurse and Midwifery two days a week um, where I teach and my interest area is um, people with dementia. Oh fantastic thank you very much for that and we'll come to your colleague Carrie-Anne back. Um, hi everyone, as Nikki said, my name's Carrie Ann. I work at South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust. Um, uh, a bit like Jane, I have quite a, a diverse sort of split role. Uh, I work in uh, CAMS uh, as the research and implementation nurse lead there, as well as doing the 70 to 70 programme and also trying to complete my PhD part-time. Uh, my area of interest, I would say, um, uh, apart from clinically CAMS is around the field of implementation science and how we uh, implement and sustain complex interventions in practice. Fantastic, thank you. And last but not least, Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen. I, until very recently, was a clinical charge nurse at the Bethlehem Hospital in CAMS, also in South London, and as of last week, we'll be joining Swansea University's mental health teaching team um, in a couple of weeks because I'm moving. Um, in terms of my research interests, I've presented at this conference a couple of times, and it's always about nursing itself, about mental health nursing itself. That's the thing that primarily I'm interested in, which is why my topic tonight is on mental health nursing identity. So can't wait to really talk about it. Okay, that's great. I'll hand you over to Mick, and I'll be looking down, but that's only because I'm looking at devices and tweeting and so forth. So I'll hand you over to Mick to start the, the questions. Hi everyone, so I'm, I'm Mick McHugh and I'm a Professor of Democratic Mental Health and uh, it's great to be with you again. Um, I think we've got, we've had, well if you've seen the videos, we've had two really good presentations and hopefully we're going to have a really interesting discussion on the back of that. And I think there are some neat connections between the two videos that, that we've watched. So I want to start with Stephen, mainly because it was the first video that I watched. Um, and you know, you you I think you do a great job of um, dissecting mental health nursing identity. But why is mental health nursing identity important in the first place? So the way that I want to answer that is by assuming that it is important and I can give answers for why it's important, but then we can take away that assumption and then target that directly, whether it is important or not. So the last part of my presentation gives a few reasons why it's important. So in terms of the politic, like politically, nursing as an institution, a professional institution, other professions don't seem to struggle 
to get certain kinds of recognition for what they do. And that could be pay, it could be conditions, it could be other things. Mental health nursing seems to struggle to really fortify itself in that way. And I think not having a clear identity is part of that. I've only been qualified for two years. I already know people who I trained with who are no longer doing nursing. I've moved around wards, I've been assaulted. You know, there's lots of challenges in this role and recruitment, development, and retention also, I think, is weakened by not having a sort of clear sense of what it is that we do. And then historically, and sort of politically with the capital P, when we look at, it's quite a, you know, a new profession if you compare it to other health professions. You know, asylum workers were still, you know, there are mental health nurses still working who used to work in the asylums. It's not that long ago that that was still happening. And asylum workers were kept out of the RCN. They were kept out of sort of being recognized as nurses perhaps because of some of the practices that used to take place in asylum. So having a modern identity helps separate and differentiate what we do now from what used to happen. But at the same time, that's not to say that everything in the past was bad and everything right now is good. There's a lot of things that still need to change, but there's some things that are that are good. So it's that thing about being, I think I used the phrase ethically confident in what's happening now, but still have that tug on your conscience that there's still lots of things that can improve, particularly around service user rights and restrictive practices. You know, we could, you know, talk about many different examples. So I think that's why it's important and why it's important. But I would like to hear what other people's reasons might be for why they think it's important. And then we could move on to whether it is or not. Right, great. Well, thanks for that, Stephen. It's a very full answer. I mean, we probably will come back to, to some of the points that you've raised there, and hopefully the audience will, will chime in with, with you know, some discussion there as well. But if I can turn to Carrie Ann and, and Jane, um, you've obviously given us a, a really good presentation about a particular initiative to develop mental health nursing identity, specifically as it relates to, to research capacity building. So. I, I've sort of suggested that's something to do with mental health nursing identity. Is it, or or, or is it something else? Um, I I think I, Reese. Well, I guess coming uh, coming from a particular standpoint and and being involved at seventeen seventy, you could say that I'm slightly biased in terms of my response. But I think I think research is intrinsic to a nursing identity. Full stop. And certainly. Um, I think specifically within mental health, um, nurses, uh, there are other professions that may be uh, research kind of, the, the relationship with research is more kind of obvious or promoted or seen as an intrinsic part of their role um, as a mental health practitioner and maybe less so within mental health nursing. And that's something that I think really needs to change because yeah, I, I would I would strongly argue that that research and and it could be research at any level. It doesn't mean that everybody wants to become a, a you know a professor of nursing, but research should be part and parcel of of our daily practice. Whether it's research awareness or being involved in uh, uh, research programs, uh, right through to somebody that maybe wants to be a clinical academic, it can be it can be weaved in at many different levels. But certainly, it should be a thread that runs through um, the nursing role. Right, thanks, Carrie. And again, again, very full answers here. So, Jane, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think um, one of the difficulties in mental health for nurses wanting to be research active and remain in practice is that there aren't always the kind of um, pathways, the career pathways. Um, and so part of our, our role, part of the programme we're on is to try and work practically with, to get nurses more um, engaged in research in a variety of ways, like Carrie Ann's just explained, but also to work strategically. So uh, there's an expectation that we work quite closely with the, the director of nursing or the chief nurse to make sure that um, that that there are changes so that, that if people do want to develop research careers, that we can develop pathways for them to stay in practice and not, um, I guess, the only option for them to feel to move to an academia. And I kind of think perhaps that's something to help strengthen um, nursing identity, to have that, that clinical academic element to it that just is quite rare at the moment. So if I can just dwell on that for a minute, do you know, do you know there's this research element of a, of a mental health nursing identity. 
Do, does that extend to all mental health nurses or are some people a bit wary of it or even excluded from it? I think people are wary of it, right from people at the grassroots up to the exec team sometimes. I think um, I think research can appear quite frightening and like it's perhaps something that other people do. Um, so I think a real challenge of the 70 at 70 is to help help people I suppose appreciate what their role is in research, um, whether that be um, sort of studies that are going on in a trust encouraging service users to take part because it's everybody's right to take part in research. So, you know, whether it be that to, um, yeah, I guess, to guess just being more research aware to kind of link it much more with using evidence in practice to improve quality of care. Um, but I know I think there is quite a lot of fear and I think sometimes you say the word research and you can kind of feel people uh, switching off or becoming a bit anxious maybe. I don't know what you think, Carrie ann Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. And I think, again, going back to this idea of nurse identity and um, that Stephen was talking about in terms of kind of what a mental, how we articulate what we do as mental health nurses, um, I think there's real opportunity with research to be able to give a voice and a narrative to how we describe the work that we do and be able to do that, you know, if you're talking about, you know, good quality research, be able to do that with authority as well. Um, and, it, and it's not something that we do necessarily. I think that was, it is seen as a separate thing that others do. And um, I, I think it's really exciting to think about the opportunities that there might be to be able to challenge that and really bolster nurses in terms of what they bring within their role. Um, yeah, there's definitely something just that the word separate there, I think, is really crucial. So I think I can always really speak from an inpatient, inpatient nursing perspective, but I'm sure it's true in the community as well. This like task creep. So you get more and more tasks, but you never lose tasks. Yeah. So the, the lockdown and Corona has been a great example of this. So I was moved to an adolescent PQ as part of a redeployment that took place in CAMS at the hospital that I was in two wards were closed and sort of four teams compressed into into two. We started having to wear PPE um, all day. We started having to do um, COVID audits, PPE checks, and these were on top of we had, uh, physical health care plans every day. The uh, physical health checks became daily as well. And this didn't, you know, the other things that were happening didn't go away. So mm -hmm. you still had, you know, all your other tasks still remained the same. And I think if research is seen as an extra, or an optional or something separate, it's not going to get done because it's just going to be like, we're already doing so much, but you can't possibly ask us to do this as well. Um, oh. Particularly when rotors are so, you know, when you work to a rotor, it's very stressful, it takes, you know, it takes a lot out of you. So it needs to be part of what you see as what you're there to do from the beginning. Yeah. Otherwise I don't think it's going to work. So I think, I think there's, um, there's a, for as long as I've been involved, there's, there's been discussion and debate in nursing about, you know, is it a sort of task orientated job or is it something else that's that's more, maybe more holistic? And there's an aspect of your presentation, Stephen, where you talk about nursing as craft work, which seems to be the antithesis of a disaggregated accumulation of tasks. Could, could you tell us a, li a little bit more about that and then maybe we yeah. can expand that into thinking about research sure so that was something so i saw a debate at a nursing conference at st george's a couple of years ago about whether mental health nurses should leave nursing so whether they should sort of try and constitute themselves as a separate profession because as one of the fields it just sits so badly with the task orientation because of the way that sort of psychological distress manifests itself, the way that person-centered care needs to be delivered therapeutically consistently in space and time, tasks take you away from a lot of the interpersonal fundamentals of what, at least in our heads, we see ourselves doing as mental health nurses. And you do get chunks of that here and there, but you don't get it consistently when you're in the system. I didn't, when I put that in the presentation, that wasn't something that I sort of projected in or was looking to find. It was something that I found. It was when I was looking at the verbs, it was lots of non-technical language. It's about being with people. It's about supporting them. It's about, you know, it was languages that you talk about how you'd look after family members or friends or, you know, just a, 
people to people relationships. And so that just suggested to me that quite a fundamental aspect of the self concept is still rooted in the idea that it is person centered, despite the fact that a lot of the time it actually isn't. Mm -hmm. So there's a dissonance that I think is quite interesting there. And yeah, so I don't know. And Peplau's, one Peplau's, um, Hildegard Peplau's book is, is Nursing an Art or a Science, I think. It's not one of the titles of one of her major texts, so it's quite a historical question. So fantastic. So Karian and Jane, would you like to pick up on, on any of those things? I mean, does research practice lend itself to, to what you might see as, as a craft where the researcher is in charge of all aspects of the job? Or does it sometimes get disaggregated into, into seemingly disconnected tasks? I think currently it is seen as something extra or an add-on. I don't think we're at the stage where it's kind of seen as the whole mental health um, nursing role. So, um, yeah, I think we are some, some way off of that. Um, something popped in my head, but it's popped out again. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> we should um, we should really probably say we've used the word set, talk to 70, 70, sort of use that as a shorthand and we haven't yet kind of explained what it is. So it might just be helpful very briefly for us to just say what the programme is for those that haven't had an opportunity to see the video yet. Um, so Jane, feel free to um, chip in at any point. Um, uh, so just to say, it's 7870 is a program. Uh, uh, initially, with 70 nurses, it was um, that were competitively selected to focus on building nursing capacity and capability within research. So it's funded by the National Institute for Health Research, and it's a three-year program. And uh, for two days a week, each of those nurses, it's their role to really focus on uh, shining a light on research and improving research capacity and capability within the nursing field, both within their local trust, uh, but also working together collectively um, as a national group as well. Um, does that, does that, have I summed it up? Was there anything you want to add, Jane? No, no, but the, what I was going to say is pop back in my head. Um, yeah. So if I can just say that now. Um, I kind of think that uh, mental health nurses are actual quite natural researchers. So I think the skills that we have as mental health nurses of being inquiring, inquisitive, um, yeah, quite creative sometimes. I just think it really lends itself. So, so it wouldn't be a too big a jump really for us to... Um, I guess embrace research and not not feel afraid of it and for it to sit well within mental health nursing profession is what I wanted yeah. to say. And particularly the skills of qualitative research. Yeah, particularly you're qualitative. Talking to people, yeah. Listening to people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd wonder because Carrie Ann and Jane and Mick, you guys are much more, you know, seasoned researchers than myself. I wonder how you feel about the impact of QI on research in nursing because it seems like the any opportunity to ameliorate services are inside like a QI framework it's like we can do this to improve this aspect of this area that we're in and it doesn't really go broader than that and often QI is it's owned by a senior clinician it's not really owned by the the, the, the nursing team or nurses within the team is owned by a psychiatrist or a nurse consultant or something and I wonder if that's a research culture. I don't know, or maybe, maybe it's not. I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that. I think, again, it relates back to what we were saying before about research being not seen as an add-on or a luxury or an additional part of your role. I think the reason why certain clinicians tend to take a lead on that uh, or if you're sort of like a training doctor, et cetera, it's part, it can be often seen as part and parcel of your training and it's built in that you have to do a research project or uh, QI projects, et cetera. So there's a lot of permission giving there, I think, to be able to take um, a lead on those that isn't necessarily given to nurses. Um, yeah, that will be my short answer. My, my little contribution to that is that, that one of the things that researchers are told off for is having less interest in implementation and application. I, I think sometimes that's a red herring, but 
I think that's why we have a quality improvement industry is, is this stuff about, well, how do we actually affect change? And I think some of the really more interesting, you know, for me, most interesting developments in research methodology around participatory methods um, is on the same territory, so to speak. It's just, you know, and very, very similar methodologies, if you like, and some, some are classed as research and some are classed as quality improvement. Some are seen as implementation mm. science and some are seen as mm. messing about with a bunch of mates, but you're making stuff happen in a tangible way. And I, I like, I've made a career out of research, but I don't think the research tail should wag the dog of service development. I think we can, we can have both and we should, you know, things like, um, you know, just because there isn't any research for something may say more about where the research monies are spent rather than whether that thing is a good thing or a bad thing. And one, one of my favorite jokes is about evidence-based medicine. And it goes something like this, you know, we tell all the nurses they have to get in, into evidence-based practice and evidence-based medicine, because in the past nurses just did what they felt like, what they'd always done. And um, they, in the, it, they just made, made the same mistakes over and over again. But with evidence-based practice, you can make some other buggers mistakes, but with increasing levels of confidence, <laughs> because there's been a little bit of research about it. But anyway, Nikki has got some questions from, from the audience for us. I certainly have. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining in. I'm really appreciating it. Um, we've got a question from Fiona Nolan, familiar, a familiar name there. Hello, Fiona. Um, I'd be interested in hearing how Jane and Carrie-Anne feel their participation in the leadership programme has impacted on them personally, as well as in their clinical practice up until now. Um, there's an, some more people um, asking about, Nicola Armstrong, um, asking um, what five uh, tips are there to support mental health nurses to engage with research? So if we both talk about and then I think I've got some questions for Stephen as well so can you guys talk a little bit about how participation in the leadership programs impacted you yeah um shall I am I okay starting carry on um yeah. I think uh, we talked at the end of our presentation a bit about this and it, it um made me think how my answer linked um quite a bit with Stephen's work um and for me, I'd say for quite a lot of years, I've worked in roles where I am, I always say I'm a mental health nurse by trade, but I've not always felt like, um, I don't know, I've not always felt like I've been practicing as a mental health nurse. That perhaps sound, sounds a bit odd, but I've kind of worked maybe in more participatory roles or more closely with service users um, or um yeah, I guess in roles where I've um, just lost a little bit of my identity as a nurse and what this programme's done for me is really brought me back to nursing and really, I guess, um, I think I said ignited, but reignited my passion for nursing and my kind of commitment to mental health nursing. Um, so that's been something that's been quite surprising, really, and I really have valued the collective, the whole collective of the 70 or is now 63 of them I think nurses but um the the mental health nurses as well that mental health nursing cohort has just been really important to me um I'd echo echo a lot of what um Jane has said I think for me personally it's been a real opportunity to sort of immerse I feel really privileged to be part of 70 at 70 because the, what, I, what I was saying before about research, that idea of it being an add-on like, or an additional thing, for that to be the majority of my working world and still being able to be uh, based in a, in a trust, I think often there's a real challenge. Um, I think Jay mentioned it earlier that sometimes if you want to get involved in research, etc., cetera, then, then there's a natural gravitation towards university because there's a more established roles and roots, uh, uh, sort of clinical academic um, roles when you think about it from a university perspective um, and less of those sorts of roles within NHS trusts. So I feel really privileged to be able to have taken a leadership role that's around immersing myself and others in the sort of, in, in the broader sense in the, about in relation to research, I guess, and saying it in quite a clunky way. But um, I think there needs to, for that cultural shift, there needs to be more of these sorts of opportunities. So for me, it's just been, it's a real 
it is it's a, it is genuinely a real privilege to be able to undertake this role um and i think i said in the um in the presentation that we did i don't really want it to end so. mm. Mm. Um, i've got some questions from some students via whatsapp and they started off asking you a question but now they're asking each other questions and they seem to have abandoned us so well done that's the whole point of this isn't it mm. it sparked a pay um, and they seem to be saying um one of the things about nursing identity that they're sort of struggling with is this idea about firefighting all the time. You know, you come onto the ward and you just mm. got the things. So the idea of then thinking about who you are and then even maybe getting involved in research, that's so far away from the reality of what I mm -hmm. think, particularly in COVID times when everyone's just been moving around and doing all sorts, they, they wondered if you had any thoughts on that. And the other one that came up was, um, and this is in all caps, kind, not smart. So I think it's that they've also been battered with that sort of, um, stick all nurses get not just not just mental health you mm. know, should, should should nurses be educated which always blows my mind every time i hear it but i guess you know let's deal with it because it's on people's minds so what yeah. about um, uh, being strategic maybe and firefighting and the other one is kind not smart um so nikki if i answer the second one first and then the first one no other profession no other profession is going to apologize for being educated i don't understand why this profession should apologize for being educated at all um, no one is under any illusions when they start a nursing course about what's involved. So I think the whole too posh to wash thing is a complete red herring. It's absolute nonsense. Right? And, to, so, and the way the kind not smart is this idea that there's a binary or some kind of opposition built between values and skills. Right. And it's just not the case. And it, often I think we talk about things as values and they, they are values, but they're also skills. So if you're dealing with somebody who's, you know, chronically self-harming, you can say something that sounds kind in a different context, but in that context is going to be very counter-therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And so to be compassionate, you might need to use different words. And therefore compassion, yes, it's a value, but it's a skill. Mm -hmm. Not judging people is a skill. It takes time to learn how to be around acuity, violence, aggression, etc., and be able to sort of you know, live with it, see where it's coming from, understand it, not judge it. The, it's absolutely absurd to position values higher than skills. I, yeah, I can't be more forceful on that point at all. And then the, the thing about firefighting, there's no answer to that because that is the reality. That's been my reality for two years is you're just, you're, yeah, you're just dealing with stuff all the time, constantly all the time. And when you're nurse, as soon as you qualify, you're nurse in charge. And so you're making decisions from day one, hundreds of decisions a day, big decisions, small decisions about every aspect of the ward. And I think nurses as decision makers is also an area where the identity is lacking, the wider recognition is lacking because you're just deciding so much on so many different frontiers to do with all aspects of the, not just the management of the ward, but the treatment plans. You're managing your staff team. You're trying to manage yourself. Mm -hmm. You could be, and you're moving between the, these different spheres of labor from a very challenging restraint to a very challenging de-escalation to a very challenging tribunal report. Mm -hmm. And you might be doing all of that inside a 45 minute window. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there isn't really an answer to that. It's a really hard job. But I think that one of the things that my presentation shows is that a lot of the identity is actually aspirational. And so you kind of, it's there despite the reality of the job and so people bring it to work rather than finding it at work i think that would be my analysis of it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah did you guys want to add to that i think you've made some really good points there thank you mm. about jane and carrie ann um i just sort of um stephen's first point is this kind of idea that we differentiate between qualities and skills and this idea that you, can you teach somebody um, you know, because some people say compassion is innate and other people go, you can teach it, etc. There's something about we need both the qualities and the skills. I can see myself as a kind person, um, but I need to have the, the, the skills to be able to demonstrate that. So it, it is this combination of qualities and skills, whether you, you want to shorthand that to smart and kind, but you need to be able to have both. I can I can internally feel I have certain qualities, but the only way the other person's going to experience those is if I have the, the right skills to be able to demonstrate it. And I just think we undervalue how important those two things 
are in nursing um, and what an actual you go back to this idea of whether nursing is an art and stuff that art and it might seem really simple but just getting alongside somebody that's distressed and doing that in a way that um things don't get escalated and um you know allows that person that space it's such we and just being able to listen and I, I get really passionate about this because I just think we we don't appreciate how how important that stuff is and um yeah I'm gonna stop because I know I'll keep uh, ranting on about it so it's better just to kind of pause but yeah I, I'm just a great I guess the shorthand is a really a, a really echo Stephen's first point we, we like ranting on this show <laughs> <laughs> that's why I handed it over I can't answer the kind of care without ranting anymore <laughs> Um, I've got a question um, for everybody. Oh, God, did you want to add something, James? Yeah, I suppose I was just thinking about Stephen's um, point about the firefighting and, you know, the way you describe that. And I just think that really clearly um, shows us one of the reasons why nursing perhaps is so far behind in terms of um, having nurses ready to go um, and put in research bids and join clinical academic career pathways. And that's why it is so important that, um, that our role, I guess, isn't raising expectations because that's the worst thing you can do, isn't it? You can go and give someone a little bit of something, a bit of research knowledge or a promise. Um, but I guess un unless things change and it becomes embedded in people's job descriptions and research, they have time for that, then um yeah people are, are going to be frustrated mm. that yeah. roll creep again can i just say and thanks to helen lavelle who's doing dinner as well 100 percent with you guys uh looking back on my newly qualified um in charge days on mays this is a band five role you know and i think as well oh. the emotional tiredness if anyone you know comes out of a shift mm. feeling like they've been run over there isn't any bandwidth yeah. at all there's not even yeah. any, any space left now, I've had those shifts, you know, when you when you just almost like leave a post-it note for whoever you're living with, say, talk to me tomorrow. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing here. Yeah, so there, I, mean, I think, I think some of these things are political, at least with the small p issues. So mm. there's a real dearth of research into the most appropriate staffing levels, for instance. There's even less on alternative mm. approaches to how we might organise our work to try and avoid. Um, the sort of mess that we're talking about. But I think the, the the conversation that we were trying to develop a bit before about, you know, art or science, craft work, cooperation, solidarity, some some of these issues can be woven into a, a reimagination of what this job might be. Because mm. when I started mental health nursing, it, and I mainly worked in inpatient environments, there was a lot less um, aggravation and firefighting but we had twice as many staff, yeah. you know, and the and the and the senior staff as well. People who've been around. Stuff. But mm. I also think that the the idea that rationality is different from compassion and caring is a fiction, mm. and it was a fiction that was developed, for instance, historically, to keep women in their place. So you know, the 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 it's the idea that these irrational women, mainly you know, mainly the the nursing workforce at the time have no intellect so it's a bit like a, the old harry enfield sketch and and who wants tim nice but dim looking after you you know you you want nice but clever don't you? so um and i think it's, it is another one where you can have your cake and eat it you know the most of these bin, bin, binaries are are fictions and they usually have been fictions that have been developed to suit a particular purpose <laughs> Usually, someone else's power and privilege is served by the pretense that the other people lack particular or ought to lack particular characteristics. Mm -hmm. mm. Another question that's coming for everybody, so feel free to weigh in on this one, is in the views of the panel, should nursing research be separate from healthcare research? And might, what might be the pros and cons of this? So kind of, mm -hmm. is there anything specific that's, that's identifiable as nursing research as opposed to health research? Do you think we, because you've, you've spoken a bit about nursing identity, do we have an identity for nurse researchers? Are they different to other health researchers? Mm. I mean, I think the, the part of um, the National Institute for Health Research wanted, again, to support all nurse, nurses to get involved in research, because by not doing so, there's going to be certain research questions that never get answered, because I guess nurses work in particular roles um, where, you know, 
medics and allied health professions aren't working or, you know, face certain situations. So I think there is a role for very specific nursing research. But then I also think that nurses have a lot to offer to broader healthcare research and be part of, I just think, you know, a, a multidisciplinary disciplinary research team with a nurse in it, it was, is an enhanced research team from my point of view. I wonder if there's anything to be gained for trying to um, establish an outside of a health sphere though, because you can kind of define that so broadly that I wonder what the sort of intention behind that question would be. I'd like a follow up from that person to sort of know where they were going with that question because like, you know, is what do they mean by health? Do you just mean physical health mm -hmm. service or are we talking about all mm -hmm. services? Do we, are we talk about lifelong health or just recovery mm -hmm. from acute episodes? I'd be interested to know sort of what they mean by that. Oh, that's a mess. They might I'd like be to answering come back you. to a peaceful <laughs> version of the old football terrace chant, which goes something like, there's more of us than you. Okay. <laughs> I'm relieved that that was the one you picked, actually. <laughs> I'm sure everyone could... Come along with me. I guess for me, um, I would like to, I think there's, there's thousands of different types of, of mental health nurse, isn't it? Because and that you nurse from your identity the same way you teach from your identity, from your personhood, from your experience. But for me, I knew I was a mental health nurse when I met other mental health nurses. Mm -hmm. And that's how I really knew. I knew that I'd found my people, even though we're really different from each other. There's something I think at the core of it, and I've never really been able to articulate it. Because I think Stephen, you when you, when you were the, the information you've drawn on, I think perhaps if you could talk a little bit more about that. I know Ben's quite interested in hearing a little bit more about about your work. Mm -hmm. Was this idea about what is it? What does it mean to be a mental health nurse? What what is it that? Why do people feel that there should be types of identity? Because for me, if I saw research by a nurse particularly a mental health nurse, that was exploitative. I would be disturbed in a way that I wouldn't if it was by other professions. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Because I have a, yeah. this is a terrible thing to say, just as well no one else can hear me. Um, I have a higher expectation of what my colleagues do. And when a mental health nurse does something that's poor, I feel it much more strongly than I do if it's mm -hmm. from other professions, although I don't like it. I, I take it more personally. So what do you, what do you guys have, have think about that? So the, the question of identity, before you can even get into the specifics of an identity, you have to sort of talk about whether identity exists in the first place. And what I mean by that is like, it's sort of modernism and postmodernism. So postmodernism would say that there's no such thing as an essence. Nothing has an essence. And I would generally agree with that in, in lots of different sort of social uh, discussion, social topics, I would agree that you finding an essence is quite difficult, it wouldn't be metaphysical in my approach to things. But nursing is different. For some reason, I find nursing different. It's like Nikki, it's like you said, you know, when you meet somebody who's a mental health nurse, there's just something there. So it sort of runs contrary to how I'd normally sort of philosophically view things to talk about mental health nursing. But I still think you can talk about an essence in a kind of postmodern way, because it's about what's enacted. So it's like, what is it that we do? Because then you have your professional performative identity. And what was interesting about the research that I did was that so much about what we do is completely missing from the identity. So we've already talked about what it's like to be a ward nurse and be a newly qualified nurse and to be firefighting. Well, restrictive practice wasn't mentioned at all in the 73 memes that were analyzed for my paper, not once. Mm. Uh, um, rent seclusion, segregation, rapid tranquilization. These are like daily things that happen on wards and we don't talk about it. And how can service users trust us as a profession when we don't talk about it? I think that's crazy. And I think the impact, we've already talked about emotional impact on the nurse, it's horrible. Restraining somebody is horrible. Mm -hmm. Like it's not why you do that job. And uh, Mick, to talk about like, uh, there's a certain rationality in play when you're in these spaces where you act, your, your behavior is like, it's risk management, right? So we do this because we say it's the safest thing. And I'm not going to say that it isn't in lots of cases, but it's also a habitual thing where like, well, this is one of the only tools we have to manage it. And an enhanced observation is one of the only tools we have to manage certain types of risk, certain presentations, but often enhanced observations can be really counter-therapeutic if the practitioner is aggravating the service user. 
And so there's a lot how yeah, a lot about what we do isn't in the identity. So I think that's really, really problematic. Mm. So think, that's yeah. Do you think this comes to the idea that you know if identity is a is a construct at the very least? So yes, yeah. Not and I think by the people the identity belongs to, but by others around them. But everybody yeah. thinks they're the good guy, don't mm. they? <laughs> like nobody well, thinks they're the baddie. Well, I, I think, think the memes, the memes the in Stephen's research were self celebratory they, they were part of the celebration of mental health nursing. Yeah. So. And that, that should be celebrated as well. But yeah. you can't be a mental health nurse without thinking about where we came from and the mistakes mm-hmm. that we made as a collective, a collective yeah. you know, and, and they are poisonous, aren't they? They're still around. And Nurse Ratchet is back, everybody. Yeah. Fantastic hairstyle, terrible, terrible personal care. <laughs> you know, so the, the, go away. Yeah. The, so the, the thing, the point I made about like aspirational identity is that at least if I just talk about myself, I will, there'll be certain times in the day where you just get a bit of time or you just have a bit of flex. And then you try and seize that as an opportunity to be the kind of nurse that you wanted to be when you started. And you can't be that all the time. And it gets really frustrating when you can't do that a lot of the time. But if you can try and do that, those are the things that really make you go stand to take a step back later and go, wow, I'm actually really good at what I do. This is actually a really difficult job and I'm actually really good at this difficult job. And so I think building in these like feedback loops of self-validation as well, because often you're not going to get the praise from the service user, from colleagues, from senior colleagues, because you're straight on to the next thing. So it's that's why I do in a way think it's more of an art or a craft than a science, because it's about mm. this kind of interpersonal stuff. You can't mm. really qu- quantify, but you can quantify their effects maybe. I don't know. I mean, that yeah. reminds me of, of Max Weber and his ideal type sort mm. of way of thinking about things that you know most things can be conceived of in their ideal but the ideal seldom actually exists in the real world but at least we can benchmark ourselves against them mm. yeah, absolutely there's lots of people joining in um so Ruri Mohan do, do ward managers get enough respect now I know Ruri and he's not a ward manager so don't worry that's not where this is going um, we have nurse, we have AMP, CBT nurses, prescribing nurses who have a certain status, but managing a busy admissions ward is a mother of all talents. Interesting point. Um, with, and then Fiona's joined in to say he, um, this role requires a huge skill set, and I can't think of any other role which is more important in influencing care. Uh, and then we come back to one about economy, which is what you guys are saying about um, restrictive practice. As the economy falters, do we fear increased pitch before or reliance on management and containment rather than, you know, more intensive um, therapy and rehab, uh, meds, not heads? What happens to the research then? You know, so you do all this research to find out what works and then it's just like the door shutting. Mm. So, and then the last one, Adrian Jagdor, hello, um, is uh, I feel there's a lost generation of nurses and newly qualified nurses are far fighting. Uh, the experienced nurse whispering in your ear while giving advice is missing. Pushing people to prescribe or leadership within two years doesn't allow for the breadth of knowledge and consolidation. Um, qualifying, is where the, uh, qualifying is where the learning of the self and life often begins. Mm. So, there we go. What do you guys think about any of those? I mean, there, there is an all England group at the minute, and Dave Mundy is on it, and I I attend some of the meetings. They they're trying to look imaginatively at the at the mental health nurse workforce crisis, and the discussions they're having on the world away from the ones we've been having tonight, mm. because in a way they're about celebrating what we like about mental health nursing trying to get a positive public image out so that people might want to join in with it who'd never thought of it in the first place. And then trying to think about what can we do systematically to keep people in the job once they've actually arrived in it. And I think the last one is the the most difficult nut to to crack, but itself needs researching and inquiry into, into what to actually do. But it doesn't always need research either. I think I think resources can be spent in an intelligent way in advance of um, inquiry. It'd be nice if they both went hand in hand, but we haven't always got that, that luxury, I don't think. Mm. So did anybody have any comments about um, different roles with different levels of respect in nursing? Um, what happens to research when the finances crash? I'm paraphrasing people's questions there quite harshly. <laughs> 
Well, anything else, actually, because we will be getting to the end soon. So if there's anything else that you guys wanted to join in on, please do. I mean, do you know the one about the resources? Does that expose mm. the limits of an idealised mental health nursing identity? Because I think one of the constraints on it is something that's come up in, in other episodes of the conference, which is, you know, are we actually, however much we want to claim a, a discrete, separate sort of identity, we're actually still subsidiary to, to biomedicine and the biomedical neoliberal way of framing madness leads us to these sausage factory inpatient units and we're, we're sort of stuck with it until we can sort of think our way out of it or rebel against it. Or at but least also that, education is smushing us all together as well, isn't it? Yeah. It's not that, um, that, that, that that separate identity in a good way is being connected to. I think one thing is for sure is when resources go down, compulsion and coercion goes up. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. You just the, the capacity to be able to sort of think differently is is reduced. We don't have the the space to be able to think about how how might we what are the different ways to think about um, how you de-escalate de instead of you know you know restrictive practice and that that freedom and I guess that's another thing where it is might be seen as a luxury to have research involved in your role because by doing research hopefully you you you've been given that capacity to engage in free that thinking that we don't get to do when we're doing the sort of the day-to-day -day job and the harder the more pressure that's put on us to me that that ability to be able to think about things in different ways gets shut down because we are doing that firefighting and it's how do we create that space for people to get really imag imaginative and curious about the ways in which our the nursing role the mental health nursing role could look mm. i think uh, nikki the question about respect for positions mm. is at least in my experience it comes down to like the leadership traits of the individuals involved so mm -hmm. It's about, for me, it's about presence. This is pretty, it's pretty typical, like cliche thing to say, but like managers who are present, psychiatrists, consultants who are present are often thought of extremely highly by the nursing team, nurses and healthcare assistants included. Um, senior managers and clinicians who are really absent or based in their office a lot of the time are thought of less highly. And I think it comes down to this idea that there's certain things on a ward that other people don't do or they are they can more easily opt out of doing them and the nursing team can't do that we can't opt out of anything and so people who are more sort of and then that's a that's a problem for their role and their identity because they don't want to slip either and start doing things that maybe they're not there to do but i've just noticed just anecdotally the people who are around the people who are checking in the people who are more involved regardless of the banding are more respected and then make your point about the biomedicine and the sort of are we still in that paradigm? I've worked in adult services for a year and CAM services for a year, and I've noticed it a lot less prevalent in CAMs. It's just diagnosis isn't really as important. It's just, it's it's much more formulation based and much more just about what the behavior is and and what the sort of the, tra and often what the trauma is, or what the trauma was and how the behavior is relating to past trauma. And in adult services, I saw hardly any of that at all. So. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mick, did you want to come to us or Jane? Um, no, I suppose, well, just to, um, I guess we're wrapping up, aren't we, very shortly. So um, just, I guess I was thinking about the questions about the five tips for mental health. Um, nurses wanting to be more involved mm. in research, you probably won't do them all. But I guess um, it's just about having courage sometimes to um, mm. not be afraid of research and to let people know you're interested, because that's something that I think through my career I've really noticed about trying to take opportunities that don't always look like opportunities, but um grasping them letting people know what your interests are um because if i think once people know that you're interested perhaps in in research then um i think be, people will be surprised at the support that is there and out, for, out uh, available for people so i guess yeah that's a, a sort of a message of 
courage if you're interested in research to let it be known and not be afraid of it. Suppose Jane as well, people who like me who work in, in in academic roles, we've got to facilitate that courage by actually being clear and not obfuscate and mystify research. Um, so I think there's there's always been that sort of, I think it's, again, it's a bit of a fiction, but this idea that there's the real world and the ivory tower world of academia. And I mean, that's another sort of false binary, but these things often have a grain of truth in them as well. So I think, mm. I think one of the missions we could be on is to make the boundary of the university much more permeable. And I think nursing might be really well placed for that because mm. the undergraduate nursing students are already crossing that boundary on a, on a regular basis. Um, I think it's a pity that continuing professional development learning has been, you know, more or less wiped out in terms of um, resources. But the growing number of nurses who are doing doctorates is is quite heartening. Um, but most of them are doing it off their own back and yeah. um, financing it themselves when they haven't got loads of cash. And I think that's a real pity. I think if we had a, there, there was once a call for personal education budgets in the NHS and an NHS university, a bit like the Open University. I think back to some of the earlier talk that we had about solidarity and there's more of us than the rest of you, please. <laughs> Why aren't we making these sort of demands? Because if we want a future-proofed um, workforce, it wants to be as knowledgeable and supported as possible. And <laughs> fair access to learning resources is, is a real issue because Doctors have no problem at all. Medical doctors, psychiatrists getting access to those resources. It's it's stitched into their career. But for nurses, it, it isn't at all really. And, it, and I look at my career, I've got a professor's job. Most of the best turns in my life were completely accidental. Mm. They, they weren't even to do with hard work. <laughs> they were just <laughs> being in the right place at the right time, <laughs> you know. So that's not right, is it? You know. Mm. Yeah, the, 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 the structures and the pathways are, aren't are there, and, um, and if they are, they're not easy to navigate. So that's something I think that we need to we need to change. Mm. I mean, what, one of my best mentors said there's, there's two types of academics. I mean, there's obviously more, but there's, the one is the one who gets to a position of privilege and then keeps trying to bring everyone else with them. Mm. And then there's the other one who bends the ladder and tries to keep people at bay and maintain the pretense that, that there's a clever bunch of people who work in academia and it's not for everybody else, you know. So so I think we've, we've got to play some of those, play out worrying away at some of those issues as well. Yeah, and I think some of the um, nurses on the programme that we're on are kind of working in clinical roles and involved in clinical research and they're wanting to go into universities to kind of, mm. I guess, um, let students see the um, realities mm. of research or what, what happens in, mm. in the NHS with research. So I guess that's one way, isn't it, of, of bridging that, that gap a little mm. bit. Yeah, that's right. I think another way is writing different stuff. So not just writing the dense scholarly reports of the outcomes of a research project, but writing in the way we're talking now in a way that does engage people and let people have the inside track because they can see it in, mm. in like plain language and everything, you know. There is the shame though, isn't there, about writing in plain language? Because it's, and, and it's always dog professions, isn't it? That's why professions make up their own language so no one else can understand and join in. But for me, you know, if you're not writing a summary of research that somebody who the research is about can read, what are you doing? Mm. You know, it's, it's, I just think it's, it's this idea about hoarding power and I read, it makes me very uncomfortable. You know, if you can't say what you mean in a way that other people can understand, then you're not, you haven't thought it through properly. Yeah. It's not the only thing I'd say to that, maybe there are other gatekeepers, like the people who do reviews of people's journal articles. Yeah, but well, that's why I think you do need to do more than one thing, isn't it? I mean, look at yeah. what you guys, you guys have done your research and then you've done a video and then you've had a conversation about mm. it. All of those things are ways in, aren't they? They help people to provide scaffolding, to be able to think about things. And I think one of the things that I really like about you, Mick, if you don't mind me saying, is the idea that you will just chuck in a concept and everyone's like, oh God. And there's Wikipedia links now to Weber. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> I feel like I've written the same article 200 times in my life, saying the, the same thing over and over again. And one of these days, people are going to pay attention. 
If you've got it published 200 times, you're not doing a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have to finish up there, everybody. But I've really enjoyed our discussion tonight. We have covered some major ground, which is exactly what a mental health chat should be like. Um, guys, we're going to have to stop now because we're going to go on to part two very, very shortly. Um, but what I really love is if people watching, if they have more questions, please use the hashtags and join in. As a, as a group of us, we'll be revisiting over the next couple of days and we'll have a look both on Facebook and on Twitter. So if you have more questions for our fantastic panel, what amazing nurse it is. Really, really, really lovely. And, and I think one of the great things about being a nurse is celebrating other nurses as well. And if you look at this panel, look at them and love them. <laughs> um, and feel free to tweet and ask them any questions. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I will say good night to you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Uh <laughs>